I was recently a guest on the Herd Quitter podcast with uh, one of my friends, Jared Lumen, who was once on ours that we did an interview. He focuses on agriculture, ag business, especially regenerative. And uh, so he asked me to be on to talk a little more about marketing and the retail of it and wanted to share that with you. Welcome back to the Herd Quitter Podcast. Today's guest is Logan Duvall of Me and McGee Market in Arkansas. And I'm looking forward to talking to him because I talk to a lot of producers who are direct marketing meat and think they need to own this animal from consumption or from conception to consumption. And a lot of times I'll maybe work with them and kind of run the numbers and show them that it maybe doesn't make sense to own the cow. And sometimes it may not even make sense to own the animal at all. But the majority of the profit is actually made on the, on the marketing end of it. And uh, Logan and his family own a local food market where they do just that. They focus on sharing the story of the farmer and they focus on marketing and a lot of things that maybe us as producers don't have the skill set, the time or, or the desire to do. And I think that's a really unique kind of service, I guess you could say, that you offer to these farmers that you work with and, and just a really cool uh, thing that we all, for those of us who maybe are trying to build a market too, can learn from is your expertise in that marketing thing. So I'm looking forward to digging into that story a bit today, but thanks so much, Logan, for joining me and welcome to the Herd Quitter Podcast. Wow. Glad to be here, buddy. Glad to be here. Yeah. So um, if you wouldn't mind, start with just a kind of maybe an overview of what you do and your family's history in it, and then kind of you know, bring us from how it started to where you are today. Yeah, so uh, currently we've, we've got an outdoor grocery store. Uh, we call it a farmer's market because, you know, that uh, that term is a lot more uh, popular and it gets people excited on the farmer's market. But uh, we're, we're an outdoor grocery store focused on as local as, as possible. For us, we, we got started by accident. Nothing, nothing was really planned with uh, my grandparents starting by collecting pecans on the property and selling on the side of the road and, and then uh, put in a garden and people started pulling in to see if they could get get the produce out of there. And so my mom had suggested that they just build a little farm stand for the couple months that uh, produce was coming out of the garden. And it slowly, slowly grew and changed a lot from there. So nothing planned, but uh, it's, it's gone, it's gone well. As far as the, the food system and everything, to me, the, the big mission, my big why is to prevent chronic disease. That That's my, my biggest issue. And I feel like my oldest of four kids was diagnosed with stage four cancer. I lost my grandpa to cancer and worked on an ambulance for years. And so I've, I've seen the, the ravages of, of chronic disease in, in a lot of different forms. And so I believe we get there by preventing these chronic diseases by eating a nutrient dense diet that's low in, in toxic foods or toxic chemicals. And then how do we do that? Well, we've, we've got to have access to it. How, how do we get access to it? We have to have markets. We have to have more of what I'm doing across the world. And those markets supporting a localized regenerative food system, the farming. And so there's a lot of stages that that goes into. And, and that's honestly, Jared, that's what I'm, I'm really passionate about and trying to do is it, it's the whole system. The marketing aspect of that is just where I've been uh, lucky to do good on. Well, I'm curious, you mentioned like localized regenerative food system, and I guess I'm curious what that means to you. What are the advantages of a localized regenerative food system as opposed to what maybe is currently largely in existence? And I guess, yeah, expand on that a little bit. The perspective that I really dive into is uh, health and wellness. So like optimization of the, the human being is like a huge, huge focus for me. And so regenerative in those that aspect and that context is going to be nutrient density. How do we get the most nutrient dense food? And what I have found just over and over and over and over, it starts with the the farm, the land, the way they're raised. So when we're looking at like the soil, we the better the soil, the more diversity with the microbes, ability to have minerals and the enzymatic function that's in that soil translates into the, the animals. And then the animals then provide a nutrient dense product. The environmental impact is just it's a huge bonus to, to me. And when we're looking at all the sides, all the things that kill, they're not they're not being used with pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, all the sides aren't being used in 
a, a truly regenerative system. And so it's working with nature and it's providing a, a low input farming that provides good food and turns out to be better for the environment. Yeah. It's always interesting to me how we all have our different perspectives and being on the land myself, you kind of mentioned your favorite thing about this is, you know, the human aspect and the nutrient density and, and then the ecological benefits are kind of a side thing and stuff too. And being on the land, I love what I see as far as like ecological benefits, watching soil change year to year and watching forages be more productive. And then the nutrient density almost is the side thing for me. It's cool to be able to produce that product as well, but it's just awesome that yeah, there's so many advan advantages. You mentioned low input production models too. I mean, we're getting rid of so many things. There's so many different advantages to these regenerative systems that it's kind of uh, seems like a no brainer, yet not everybody is uh, interested or, or willing to make those shifts. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of reasons, which maybe we don't need to get into today, but I appreciate that definition of regenerative agriculture in your mind. And Go ahead. Did you have Jared? I think that, that that's what the retail side is so important, right? Because they take we take the marketing and the awareness and the relationship building, and we just blow it up, right? Like that. That's our world. Is how do we help others experience it, become aware of it? Because there's so many moving parts in, it. and a lot of times farmers don't want to deal with people, right? Like I mean, there's times I don't want to necessarily deal with people, the, the general public, and but when you have these siloed focuses that, that are interconnected for the greater system, man, it just works. So, you know, we partner with farmers and we actually buy the whole head and then have it uh, processed to specs, right? So it's under our umbrella, but we partner with the farmer and we take, we take on the, the retail responsibilities with that. That's awesome. I, I think especially the fact that you're willing to take the whole thing, part of the reason we've gone into making our own market and not going down the wholesale markets is that very reason of the stress of like if we go to wholesale and they want all of our steaks and somebody else wants all of our whatever, what do we do with all of our roasts and things? And so your, your willingness to take the entire animal and figure out what to do with it already is pretty awesome. But before we even get into the, the meat specifically, what are all the products and which farm, what are all the types of farms that you have relationships with that you're marketing? So we, we start, produce is still like the number one aspect of the business uh, without, without question. So we have different farming partners based on different niches, right? So like we have a family that does our strawberries. We have another family that do the tomatoes, the heirloom tomatoes and a lot of squashes, specialty eggplants, another one that does the, the okra. And so just that expertise and well passion to do it, you know, some of it, you know, my, my tomato grower refuses to do okra because he hates it, right? So he's like, I'm not doing it. So we have to find somebody to fill that void. It's a, it's a big need for us. Pecans, like, I mean, we're a full, full on, you know, grocery store. So we've got, we've, we've got it all. Wow. Okay. And is everything sourced locally or do you go with wholesalers for certain products that you can't find in local markets? Yeah, no, everything is not sourced locally. My philosophy is to get what we can partner first. This is like, think of it like in rings and it goes out. So at the core, it's a partner farm. They grow and we buy the entire crop from them. And then we figure out what to do with it. And then as the need goes, well, I still want it to be, in, it's because we're in Arkansas. I still want it to be geographically within, you know, a 60, 70 mile radius. And then we go out, we just keep going out. But like right now we've got, apples from Washington. I have, have pink pineapples from Costa Rica. Like, so we, there's a wide range, but going back to the mission, I want absolutely everything to be as locally produced as possible. That's interesting. Cause I, I don't know how anyone would do, I, I guess I talked with some, I've talked with some restaurants and some maybe stores too, that they just have a super variable market that is totally what's going to be there you don't know because it's going to totally depend on what you can find available locally at the given time and so do you have fairly consistent product offerings throughout the year and you kind of do this by sourcing from wherever it's available or is your market pretty variable throughout the year as well it varies significantly and what we do is i, I put out a full availability list every thursday and because it changes so much even from week to week there's seasonal themes Right. Like so in the fall, we know we have pumpkins and mums and the, the root crops, acorn squash, all that kind of, of thing. But then in the early spring, it's herbs and strawberries. Right. Like so it's always changing their seasons, but there is a consistent, always variable. Sure. Oh, that makes sense. Cool. 
Well, let's get into the marketing then, I guess, because that's kind of where I would say a lot of farmers are not really maybe don't have the skill set or the knowledge or we're all trying to figure out how to do better. And you guys have worked on this for a while. What things have worked for you? What are some of your ways that you have succeeded in in getting your name out there and getting your product offering out there? I think the best uh, first step is just just focus on relationships. I think that's the number one thing. And, and, you know, we do business with people that we like. And so regardless of is, if you want to do the farmer on the sale or work with a partner that, that still follows the, the philosophy of getting it, is you build a relationship and share share the, the why. The reason that you're doing something is, is what we have done. So social media, we've leveraged that. To me, social media is no different than like your, your word of mouth. It, it's just a way to get it out there on a larger scale. But you want to use every interaction as a way to add value to somebody else. And so Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, is one of the greatest business books of all time. And it's it's based off just relationships and taking care of people. To me, I, I cringe when I see a lot of marketing. It's uh, come buy my product, stop by and see me, do, do these things. And, it, and it's like, that's not adding value to somebody, right? Like, so there's a way in which we communicate. It's no different than going to like a networking. Let's say you're going to a grazing conference. It's a hand a business card and, hey, check out my website and buy my meat. Well, that's not going to get anything. It gets you anywhere, right? You want to, how, how can we add value? Here, I love your podcast. Let me share it and add value to, because I'm helping you. It, it's no different in a transaction. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I... You kind of the the idea of marketing itself, like you said, almost gives you kind of uh, negative feelings and stuff. And it's interesting when we we started marketing our brand, Grasshead Cattle Company, in the Twin Cities. We took over from a customer base or from somebody who had already kind of established a customer base. And when we took over, we tried to do some targeted marketing, and we were smart. You know, we thought we know who our targeted audience is. It's the wealthy class in these neighborhoods, and we sent out because our product is more expensive and this and that. And so we sent flyers to these certain neighborhoods and things, and we had a horrible success rate with that. You know, it's interesting, like this intentional marketing, trying to find the people we thought were our customers was a total flop. And where we found success was actually going to like a home and garden show or something completely separate from food. But what everyone there is related to food and the people who care just they found us and they were excited they saw us and were interested and intrigued and it wasn't out you know getting flyers to certain people it was just putting our story out in front of everybody and letting the people who already care about these things that you're talking about uh you know the regenerative food that the uh, nutrient density the health aspect of this food come to us and that's that's kind of what you're saying that's exciting we don't have to maybe focus in on trying to identify your perfect customer or whatever. Right. Yeah. We're, we're not on a crusade to change people. What we're doing is providing a solution, providing mm-hmm. options. So it's not trying to convert a vegan to carnivore. It's trying to offer somebody that wants a higher quality, whether it's ethical, regenerative, whatever the, the their personal uh, principles align with and offering that solution and just making sure they're aware of it. And, and when you take care of them, now, now they, they come back and they, they buy again or they, they sing your praises and they help you market through sharing posts or, or telling their friends. Yeah. No, and that part's exciting too is the uh, when you make a relationship with somebody, we have a bunch of customers that they genuinely want to help us. They're not just in it for themselves, but they know us. They know Val, my wife. They know me. They probably know you. And they say, this is a great family. I love their story. I love what they're doing. I'm going to tell everyone I know about this so that they can come too. And then, yeah, you don't even need to market. They're doing the work for you. Exactly. When, when you take care of people, gen- genuinely take care of people, uh, it, it works out. And I, I mean, there's a whole backside of the business where you have to be efficient and consistent and execute, right? Like there, there's not one without the other. But when you you take care of people and you deliver, uh, it's it's pretty easy. really. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. Well, that's that's a good point then. So, you know, we talked about this marketing piece a little bit then, but you have to have the service there to back it up because, you know, if you if you have this mission and everybody buys in, but they come and the shelves are empty or they've, you know, do a little digging and they find that maybe the products that you're selling aren't, don't line up with what the values that you've stated are. 
uh, they're going to be disappointed and, and that'll spread just as fast as the good news will. So how are you backing up all of what you're putting out there? What does the logistics of your operation look like? What's the detail? Maybe these are two separate questions, I guess, before we get into the logistics of, you know, keeping the shelves full and stuff. What is the what is the work that goes into sourcing the products to make sure that it aligns with your your promoted vision, your marketing goals, or your your uh, yeah your kind of visions and, and values? The sourcing can be a booger uh, because you what what are your parameters? Like all of us have different things that matter to us. Is is local more important? Or is regenerative more important? You know, is it uh, the monogastric versus a ruminant more important? So what what we have to do is find that common ground and encourage movement towards where we want. So if I'm sourcing it, you know, I can encourage a, a beef farmer to also raise lamb, right? Like, so they, they may not have done that without the outlet. So the sourcing is almost a singular focus uh, and, and it, it does take a lot of time, uh, especially starting out. But once you, it can start taking care of itself when you get lined up. The find your parameters, and then find somebody to fill that, find, find a partner. And I really, really like the word partner versus uh, vendors and stuff like that, because it, it frames that context to be, we are in this together, right? We're, we are partners. I, we're not just taking advantage of me. I'm not taking advantage of you. It's not just solely a transaction. So when you find those partner farms, you can source things that fit those principles that we have. There's no cookie cutter model regardless if we're, you know, Minnesota or Georgia or Florida, California, everything's going to be different because there's different seasons, there's different growing climates for, especially for the produce. So just outline it, knowing what you want and making sure you can communicate that with your partners and you're willing to work together. That's, that's the biggest advice for sourcing because you're going to have all kinds of options out there. They just got to find the ones that align. Yeah, and I imagine the larger you get, the more farmers you partner with, the harder it is to kind of do quality control. I mean, to make sure that they are following the principles that you do. Do you have any systems in in you know in place of actually ensuring that they are doing what you hope they are doing? <laughs> yeah, and so part of what we do is uh, we create a lot of content. So like videos, like we we went down to White Oak Pastures and filmed a documentary with Will Harris. Hopefully that'll that'll be out pretty soon. The, that's actually how I found found you. I was I was researching for Will and came across your podcast. Go see them. I, go see them. Go go do marketing strategies that collaborate collaborate and show to the you know consumer that you are doing it right. So like if uh, Hoyn Beef is our primary uh, partner on beef, we went and filmed a whole little little uh, episode there, right? Like so, it's a, a TV show. And we can share that. We have it on YouTube now. You can go look. Our, we can always use that asset to show this is our partner on the beef. This is how they do it. This is why we trust them. And now, now you know, whoever's buying that meat knows their story too. And it means more to them. So that, in my opinion, going back to the marketing piece, is the best way. And I call it like a, a guerrilla tactic, right? Like, so we're marketing by providing value, <laughs> Right. Like we're, we're telling their story and then people have more of an interest and more reason to buy it because they know more about it. Well, I think that's cool. And that's unique, even like where a producer may go to the grocery store. And I don't know if this is common down in your area, but Thousand Hills Cattle Company. I don't know if you see that in grocery stores down your area. They're a big one. They're actually based out of here, but they're nationwide. They're 100 percent grass fed beef. They're United States raised, which is actually kind of unique. A lot of things are foreign in grass fed world. But if you do that and you go to the grocery store, you see Thousand Hills beef. You don't have a clue who raised it. It could come from any one of tens or hundreds of farms across the United States. Same thing with all of the other product brands probably out there. I mean, you see a brand, but it doesn't tell you anything about the farmer. And you you may not be raising it yourself, but you work directly and partner with directly the farm so you can share their story in a way that a thousand hills or whoever else can never can never do which is unique and, and offers not only value to to you i guess as marketing value but value to the consumer too they know exactly what they're getting absolutely and i think that is where we have to go back to the the whole know who you are and what you want and what scale do you want to be at so for me i i want to build 
a replicatable system. I don't want to scale out infinitely. I want to be able to take the principles that we have and be able to place them anywhere in the world. And it just, it looks a little bit different. So I don't want to work with a major retailer, right? And have, have them in a thousand different stores on, on just the meat. We want to build a localized regenerative food system that can be placed because I don't think that we should be shipping stuff across the country. I think that we should first feed our, feed ourselves, feed our neighbors and grow out into whatever scale we want. And then we were able, if, if we did that, just think about if we had 15,000 of those systems across the country, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't need the way that we're doing it now. That's interesting. And it's, it would be awesome. I would love that. Uh, it comes with challenges and and also with uh, extra cost, and that's something that uh, I, I don't know. I imagine it is the same down there. Is we, we have added costs that we can't compete with the scales of efficiency of scale that some of these other food suppliers can, but uh, but we can offer so much more in value. So I like that you offer building your local economy. That that's what you have to offer over a thousand hills. You through through a sp- specific marketing you know ploy is you can showcase that the money spent in the the Twin Cities stays right here in the area that goes back to support your family, right? Support the service industries that you're you're dealing with, you know, whether it's a local tractor dealership or, you know, a local gas station, like whatever it is that you're doing, you're keeping the money local. And I think that that's something that we, we don't do a good enough job of, like when they go to the grocery store and they buy a thousand heels, where does that money go? Well, it leaves, right? And that's what I love so much and why we went and shot that documentary down at Wild Oak Pastures is because what Will has done is created a way of bringing money in. It's not just taking it out. So if you look at the rural land across the country, it's dying. Like I'm from a small town. I've, I've, I got agrarian community. I've lived this. They are dying. People are moving to cities. The land is getting gobbled up by corporations and they're doing a commoditized farming system. And so what happens is those cities that were historically dependent on the agriculture there on a, on a smaller scale, they're leaving. And so what Will's done is he's aggregated the property, the animals, the systems, the processing facilities, and he's he's taking it in a way that it's adding value. It's building Bluffton, Georgia. You know, it's arguably one of the poorest counties in the country. So I think that that system of, of retail, that because that's what he's doing, he's supporting the regenerative agriculture through optimizing retail. To, to my whole point, we have to have more markets if we're going to prevent chronic diseases because that supports the farmer and it connects the consumer. Because we can do anything, but we can't do everything. The farmer cannot do every aspect. We can't do everything. We can't farm and do the retail. So it all matters and it all it all works works together. I appreciate that you brought up the economic side of it because yes, it's more expensive, but there is so much truth to what you just said about it being local um, and what it can do to a community. And for those who haven't heard Will Harris's story, that was episode 55 on this podcast. If you want to go back and listen to it, and I look forward to seeing your documentary you did there. That'll be awesome. I, I just wonder, like on a commodity system, like you're saying, how many, if a producer sells wholesale to Tyson Foods, you know, how much money leaves that community versus everything direct and how much good that can do for a community? What is the, they say a dollar is spent seven times or something through a community? I forget how it works out, but, uh, you know, the keeping money local and it's, it's exciting. That's a fantastic point. And Jared, I grew up in the, in my grandpa raising, uh, he still raises broiler chickens for Tyson uh, that you brought up. So like I have been a part of every one of the systems. I worked for a vet growing up uh, through college and high school that uh, did uh, Cargill uh, hog houses, right? So like I, I have been a part of every part of the system and I have seen where we either do an extraction model or a prosperity model. And uh, it, what we are doing is killing rural America, like the system that we have, and it's causing chronic disease. Like it's, I believe that wholeheartedly. The opportunity for me is when we create the awareness, when we get this message out there, we can all participate. We all have a role in the system because we we vote with every cent we spend. We're either voting to support the corporate system or we're voting to build our local economy, our local farmer, our local small businesses. So. Every one of us has has a role to play, 
and as a consumer, we can help support those producers and pro producers have to step up whether that's a you know retail producer or it's an agricultural product producer we have an opportunity there is so much hope. i'm excited after going down to bluffton and and seeing how people have responded through changing up their diets and you know may adding some nutrients that they may be missing it's a game changer and it's getting better and the more the more we have involved in that system will hit this critical mass to where we can actually make a change yeah good points i just think an, an anecdote that kind of describes the economic thing too i was just having this discussion with somebody here not too long ago i don't remember who it was with but about chicken and we're raising pasture chicken we just got in our first batch here 600 chickens a week ago and uh and i was talking with somebody about the cost of chicken and, and they, I, I asked, what's the cost of a cooked chicken at Costco? Like you can get those ready to go whole birds cooked. And I think they said like four ninety nine or something like that for a, a full chicken ready to go already cooked, like bring it home five bucks. That's the cost of my processing alone. <laughs> the feed costs, the pullet costs, the transportation costs, the processing costs, it all adds up. And so it's a totally different game changer or a totally different game. But like those two dollars goes to a local hatchery and five or six or seven or eight dollars or whatever goes to the local processor and the however many dollars in feed costs goes to nurse strand ag down the road and they're kind of a local co-op food uh feed mixer grinder and stuff and so it yes our birds cost five dollars a pound instead of five dollars for an entire cooked whole chicken ready to eat but all of that money is you know feeding local families and encouraging local businesses as opposed to a different system so we get to choose I've, I've always said you know that consumers the best way to vote to change the food system has nothing to do with politics or who you elect in dc it's about what you spend your money on and if you want to see a change start supporting those changes with your dollars because demand drives you know it's supply and demand if, if there's more demand uh, for it that will drive the price up and bring more producers into the to the system and so that's we need consumers to make that decision in their own lives and uh it's funny how oftentimes i hear that people are upset with the current egg system yet they're buying those five dollar whole birds at costco and feeding their family with that and that's kind of contradictory or <laughs> hypocritical in a way so yeah and jared i think that you you are spot on with the politics don't don't save us they don't make a change because the sediment that has been the the secretary of agriculture for since eisenhower has been basically get big or get out like they, they have not supported the small farmers uh, historically in any manner. They have supported the corporatization of agriculture. And so to, to that point, it's, it's on us. And that's why I'm saying with the awareness and the stories and the why, that is our opportunity to make localized impact that's replicatable. The other thing on, on the chicken, like what, what should we be raising, right? So based off the economics of what, what you have talked about numerous times is the inputs. Well, when we look at a monogastric like a chicken or a hog, uh, we are going to have a lot of inputs, right? Versus a ruminant that we can basically grow on grass. That's pretty much what we can do. And so Joel Salatin, uh, Gabe Brown, you've got uh, Greg Judy, you've got a lot of people doing this. So this is not something some crazy guy from Arkansas saying like on this ruminant model, we are so low input that we have the opportunity to grow that segment. We, we really, really do. I think that we use chickens and hogs as more of, a, I mean, people want it, right? Like there's going to be a demand, but I think that the way that it's used, uh, you know, by Will, uh, Joel, it's a product uh, or it's a tool for the farm, right? So they're adding nitrogen to the pastures through the chickens or they're clearing brush with the hogs. They're, they're aerating them. So they're doing all these things, but they're using them for a purpose. And then they're actually having a product that they can also sell. The ruminant opportunity is massive. And as the new health stuff is starting to be like, essentially we're, we're kind of at these paradigm war with like meat causes cancer. It's terrible for you versus and everybody should be vegan. And then we have the carnivore movement that's saying that's, that's essentially wrong. And so there's a lot, a lot of back and forth there. We should be eating more meat. And this is coming from somebody who has studied cancer and chronic disease, probably more than, than most doctors, honest to God, but we need to <laughs> yeah. be eating more of it. Yeah. 
No, uh, man, we have a ton of di- directions we could go with this conversation. I, I would love to dig in further on the the ruminant value. I, I another thought I have a lot of thoughts on, but I I know we have a limited amount of time, and I want to learn more about your actual marketing because I know we have a lot of farmers that are doing direct marketing and would like to do more and want to learn from how you guys are doing that too. And I think it's valuable, even though you're not a producer, that all you're doing the very thing that our farmers uh, who are marketing could learn from. Um, I would love to see more more of kind of your model pop up because as a producer and marketer, it's hard. We can't do it all. I mean, we're running around like crazy to be able to dedicate time and mental capacity towards it, what is really a totally different business uh, in marketing. It's no longer farming. It, I mean, it is a totally different business. It's just challenging. And so it would be cool to see more farmers who like, have maybe you got a couple kids and one of them doesn't want to be a farmer directly but they they're interested in the farm and the story that could not only market the products for that farm but could be this sort of aggregator and accumulator of local food products and do this i mean we need more people doing that but let's dig in more specifically to your market the logistics of it talk about your are you in a major city or are you kind of out and out away from a farm or from from the city talk about your location how does that play a role in in your actual marketing strategy so little rock is the capital of arkansas and so we're right outside of of little rock i live an hour away uh from where the market is so you have to have a demographic you have to have a population base to support something and some you know that that looks different regardless of where you are you're, you're going to have to be where the people are uh, or or have a significant enough attraction to get people to you like that that's that's just the way that that works so the marketing aspect of it has been slow so social media is is massive uh for us so it's me and mcgee market like the song me and bobby mcgee that was my grandparents last name facebook is is our number one and then and then uh, instagram but use it to build the relationships and and it starts out so so slow. We have grown so so slow at the start until you hit a point that it just kind of takes off. Kind of like that overnight success thing. It's overnight success after fifteen years. We do have about a six hundred thousand uh, population within about a forty five mile radius. So I mean, pretty significant size. But we do have a lot of people in the in the metro of of Arkansas. Yeah, it's interesting. I mentioned like we took over our brand from somebody else and they were not farmers. They were they lived in the Twin Cities. And so they had kind of a location established in the Twin Cities. And I do think that has been a significant contributor to our success is having a convenient location. Um, we, our farm is an hour out of the cities and we tried, I tried for years marketing on Facebook and different things, not probably with the intensity that I could have. And I, uh, but, but when we were up there, we're found so much more often just being in the right location. It's just, I thought something worth mentioning maybe that, uh, yeah, that location can matter. And there's lots of people who build businesses entirely remote. They're not in the cities. They offer delivery options or shipping or something like that too. But I, I do think it, it does add challenge. And so if you can get in front of people, now we're getting to the point where we want to actually move away from that location there and do everything delivery. But we built and grew our brand and established because we were in a place where people were. And I think there was value to that. Yeah. And there, there's pros and cons to every system and in geographic restraints. But I think that the the wider range of offering is a really good opportunity, uh, the, the aggregation, and because it allows you to have more partners that can be participants in this system. So if we could not make it if we sold beef only, right? Like if there's no, that doesn't pay the bills. That is a sliver of what we do. But by having the tomatoes and pecans and the sourdough bread and, and then all of it together, it's, it's a different experience. And so... It goes back to solving people's problems. You don't have a business unless you sell something. You have an idea or you have an, a hobby or something. If you're not selling something, you do not have a business. So when you are selling something, it needs to be filled the need or the want bucket. And the more of those buckets that you can kind of put together, that's why people a lot of times will go to Amazon to place an order because they can get 10 different things versus going to an individual supplier and just order one thing. And then if they need something else, go another. they're not going to do it. The aggregation component, creates less friction and it can build uh the the whole system that's actually something that i wanted to ask you about because 
you know, we found the same thing is that we, when you establish some sort of a market for people who value this type of food, like one of the biggest costs and one of the biggest challenges in building a market is building the market, getting the customer. Once you've gotten the customer that consumes all these different products, it seems like a no brainer to try and offer them more of the products that they've already wanted and that the costs kind of are limited. Your main cost is that a customer acquisition after that, the more you can sell to them, upsell more products, the better. And our limiting factor, we're, we're right now just beef, pork, and chicken, all meat, is freezer space. We'd love to have turkey and lamb and all these different things. We just don't have the freezer space, so we haven't been able to diversify further. But it definitely it probably is, it seems like one of the best things we could do for our market would be to just add more products, figure out a way to add more products to our customer, our existing customer base that already wants those things. You know, and two two things on that going back, I wasn't trying to just knock chicken. That, that wasn't wasn't my intent. But Will, you know, he told me that when he is out of chicken, it hurts the sales on everything else. And I thought that's something I've really been ruminating on and trying to figure out. If he doesn't have chicken, it hurts the sales of everything else. That's that's a very very interesting concept that he's experienced, he's lived. So you almost help everything else by having more to offer. With within reason, right? You don't you don't get everything. It's just what what is a fits the want and need of the customer base you have. One more thing, Jared, to go back. The on marketing, there is another aspect that we take pride in that I don't know that anybody else has uh, that I have seen seen do like this. So I want you to picture we're right off a medium uh, traffic highway, uh, and it is a old farmhouse. Out beside it is a little shed, a little produce shed that's cedar with an awning that has fold downs filled with produce. So you can see the red of the tomatoes and the yellow of the squash just on there. You pull up, it's under these 70 to 100 year old pecan trees and you get out, it's a slower pace. You can walk through, it's shaded, a little bit of a breeze. It might be, it's Arkansas, right? It could be 100 and humid or it's freezing cold, but you've got, you've got this little controlled climate that's still outside but based off of the, the microclimate of the trees is what I mean. The experience, everything's a landscape. My mom is a is a business partner. She makes the the experience of simply walking through the market so relaxing and peaceful and enjoyable. That's part of marketing. The experience somebody has. Don't you think about if you go into a Walmart or something, you got these bright lights in your face and these just straight rows of, of product. It's not enjoyable. You don't you don't just take your time and leisurely scroll th through a department. Like we just don't do that. It's get in and get out. At least this for me. And so the the experience, that's what I have on the business card. It's like that's the tagline. It's me and McGee market in quotes. It's the experience. So like if somebody comes out here and says, I just feel great. I feel better as I'm leaving than when I got here. Then we won. I don't even care if they buy something. But when you take care of people and you provide that value to them, that psychological, emotional, mental value, they reciprocate through buying something or spreading the word. So that's a that's a big part that I, I don't want to, to try to take away. It's how you make people feel is what they're going to remember and when you take care of them they're, they're going to take care of you well i completely agree with that last thing you just said of what people remember is how they feel i've always thought that too that you know i don't remember even like speakers i'll, I'll, I'll go and watch a speaker and i won't remember what the speaker said but i'll remember the feeling that i came away with of empowerment or excitement or regret or whatever the feeling or whatever that i left with that specific talk and I think of places that I've been and I don't remember a lot of the specifics, but I remember feeling peaceful and feeling enjoyment and different things. And so, yeah, experience is huge. It's interesting because this marketing thing, a lot of people are going the shipping route, the direct or like the delivery route. They don't have a location that they can have that experience. Do you think there's any ways to somehow tie an experience to a non-physical location? in a way that you, you've kind of done? I think it's very, very difficult. And I think that kind of uh, 
illuminates the trap of social media. There's a documentary on Netflix, I think Social Dilemma or something like that. And it talks about like we're more connected than ever, but we are the most disconnected that I think we've ever been in history because we don't have the physical interactions. I think people crave the physical interactions. And I think that is what has set us apart. We got umpteen different delivery services around us and people still come here. Because it's the experience, it's the relationship, physical. I think there's an opportunity for, for all of it, but I think that in order to be aligned with, with my philosophy of building economy, the local economy and community, you have to have physical interactions. But, but I think we can leverage that with, with social media and digital, YouTube, all of it, even these type of conversations. This is a interaction that other people can relate to and it just builds more credibility and, and a stronger a feeling of, of that relationship. Yeah, no, and that's a good point too. And and I think on our farm, how we don't have that experience in our storefront. We don't have a storefront. We have a location, a freezer space that when people get there, or they call us and we bring it up to their car because the site has no emotional excitement. It's just a, a room with a bunch of freezers. But how we've engaged in an experience is we last fall, we did a farm event where we invited out people. We had a tent out on top of the hill overlooking the pastures. We had a locally grown food meal. And so it, it's not as regular of an experience, but we were that was kind of a way that we tried to get that experience to share. And that's something that we've always valued too is we love what we get to do. Let's share that experience with other people. And so I think I think you're right. And it may not be an every week or an every time they go shopping thing like they get to experience with you, but that's one way that farmers who maybe do the delivery model can tie in experiences an annual event or my wife had thought about doing like throughout the summer a monthly hike you know through the farm like we have a three mile kind of hike that we could do through the pastures and stuff some way to get people out on the land to experience it in a way that they otherwise can't absolutely i think how do we share the experience of of food you mentioned that you purchase everything the whole animal um I don't. I assume you do that with all the different beef, pork, chicken, whatever you, it is that you sell. How are you managing inventory? Kind of that challenge that I mentioned, the the stress of how do you market your roasts when where not many people want to or know how to cook roasts anymore or something like that. How do you manage the inventory of all of your product in a way that you're not accumulating, accumulating, accumulating certain products? <laughs> So I have a four phase outlet uh, is how I market it. So our number one phase, our number one bucket is going to be the retail side. That's where we have the highest margin. It's where we, we get to interact. Then you have, and this is not just solely on meat, but uh, we have a value added aspect. And that's going to be taking a tomato and creating sauce or taking a, a uh, cucumber and making pickles or strawberries and make jam. It's a value added component. And then that gives us another product to sit on the shelf that has has some longevity. Then you have uh, your, your wholesale partnerships and by wholesale distribution. So I work with Lord a dozen really high quality chefs and restaurants that will come through uh, and they, they pick up bulk. And the other one is going to be our own food service. So, we, you know, we have a, a food truck where we do burgers and, and rice bowls and uh, burger bowls. So it's very simple, but it's still using everything from here. But it gives us the opportunity with specials to utilize whatever we may have an overabundance of that we don't move through a partner restaurant or the value added. I don't believe can be dependent on one source. Uh, it, this model doesn't work if you only have one outlet because there's days in tomato season, Jared, that we are getting 600 to 1,000 pounds of tomatoes a day, right? And these are heirloom tomatoes. So you, you think your Cherokee purples, your brandy wine, things that they, they do not hold up like those shipping tomatoes do, that you got to turn them over. And we sell a ton of them retail, but you inevitably still have to do something with it. And that's where the value add in this special, like say a BLT special, uh, you get on the phone with your chefs. Hey, we have, you know, X amount of, out of product brother. There could be a masterclass on this, all the different angles and avenues of it. There's a lot to it, but you cannot be solely dependent. That's why I am not a huge, huge fan of the straight retail model. If you don't have the right partners and, and going back to that content creation stuff, so let's say there is an incredible restaurant in the Twin Cities that is known for using local, high-quality things. Well, now let's go in and do a recipe. Let's have the chef make a steak. We film that. We share that. Hey, thank you for using our beef on your menu. Go check them out. Uh, that, that kind of a thing. There's collaborative content that we're not taking enough advantage of. 
Yeah. Great thought. A huge stressor for a lot of people. And, and that was kind of something I can't remember even the name of the person that I talked to is just, that's what he said is you just got to go out and you got to find outlets for the different products. There's people out there who want all the things. And if you try to sell it all yourself or do it all yourself, it can be a real challenge. And especially if you're doing, it sounds like everything retail, do you do any bulk sales of meat to kind of bulk everything together the the stuff people do and don't want all together just to move it in more quantity no it just it well i mean if a, if a chef comes through and needs needs it then then yes there's a basically a retail minus uh whole bulk discount that they they can get and then because it's resale they don't pay sales tax because they collect this tax you, you just have got to be creative like what is it like on this last one we got you know tongue and heart uh, and, you know, marrow bones, all this stuff that a lot of times it's not going to be sold retail and a restaurant's not necessarily going to use it. So we either eat it or, or we just get creative with it, uh, through the, you know, do a street taco day for tongue or whatever. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. I'm, I'm very impressed that you're able to move everything at that like retail level because I just don't know how we do it. And, and we don't probably because we don't have those markets, but we're doing it in the way that we sell as much as we can in eighths quarters halves, as much bulk as possible. And we only sell retail what we have extra after we've made as many eighths as we can. And so we limit our quantity of those other cuts and we move everything else in bulk. And that's been our way of managing that inventory. But we give up a lot of profit potential because we're selling a lot of steaks at our wholesale or at our bulk price where it could be earning 20 bucks a pound, 25 bucks a pound. It's getting nine or 10 or whatever, you know, but we're also moving those other cuts. So there's pros and cons to everything. But the fact that you're able to move so much at retail is huge and very impressive. Well, and, and another aspect of that is like, the, say the food truck So I have a burger food truck, right? Like it's because I can put more to ground and I'm able to use it. Like that, that's how you have to get creative sometimes. And so when, when I have, you know, a, an animal processed, I get our most popular cuts for retail that we need. And then the rest of it goes to ground. That way we can serve it on something. I mean, it, you know, it's extremely popular, like it's burgers. And so when you, when you have the story that goes with it, you can do even more and you have a higher price point. The food system is the key. It's, it's building the food system. It's not building a component of the food system. Yeah. Well, I love the food truck. I think I maybe mentioned to you when we talked last time that that's something we pretty seriously considered doing as well. It's just we don't want to add one thing more to our plate right now. But I would love to do that for a ground beef market, not only for our extra ground beef from our steers, but to add value to our cull cows, things, you know, animals that otherwise would be just sold at cull price that that uh, is not getting a maximum value out of that. I think there's huge opportunity in that. So if somebody wants to start a food truck in the cities for us and and market our ground beef. <laughs> We've got it for you, but I love that you guys have done that. I think that's the perfect thing is it's ha who, who is the right partner? It's, it's who, not how, uh, you know, that's a Dan Sullivan, uh, book. It's, it's who, not how. So like on the food truck, it's not me. I'm not cooking. I don't even run the food truck. I have a partner that's a chef and good at business, right? So we, you, you don't have to do everything. And I think that if you try to, you will fail. So we, you, it's building the food system, right? So I don't farm it. I don't raise that cow. I don't, Lord, I don't do a lot with the retail, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm running the business and I don't run the food truck, but we can coordinate that food system. Yep. Perfect. Well, is there any other thoughts or things that you think we should touch on before we start to wrap up? I just think we are through, through the last couple of years at such a beautiful opportunity for people being willing to, to make some changes. I think we're, it's, I think we need to be excited instead of down and pessimistic. I think that, that more people are, are going to be coming to where they care about where their food is. I, like I see it every day. And I think that if we embrace that and we provide that and we deliver, it's just going to keep getting better. Uh, and we, we can't wait on somebody else to come in and save us. Nobody is coming to save us. Nobody's coming to save our businesses, save our way of life, our farming. It's up to us to do it. And uh, and I'm excited. Let's let's get to work. Great thoughts to wrap up on. Two questions I've got for kind of all my, my guests before we wrap up. Um, one is, what are two, three something recommendations, books, podcasts, conferences that are really you think valuable? You mentioned a couple throughout the podcast already. You can use those again or you can use new ones that you think were essential in what you do or would be valuable to farmers wanting to do the same thing. My biggest recommendation is going to be don't simply go into a sounding board. 
don't just read the only things that fit your niche. Get get a different perspective. So for me, it, the the genres that I do is it's you know self improvement, health. I, I love ag- I don't even farm, but I love agriculture. Um, and then you know business. So. I would I would highly recommend anybody that's interested in the marketing side. Uh, John Lee Dumas has wrote he has Entrepreneurs on Fire. It's a podcast. I think it's a great podcast. Each episode's fifteen minutes. It's it's easy to knock those out. Uh, he wrote a book, The Common Path to Uncommon Success. So anybody that wants to know more about what I was meaning on the create content and do diff- th- those type of things, that's huge. the The revenue from outside of simply Jared selling selling the beef in the Twin Cities. That that's that's only a fraction of what you can be doing, right? You have the podcast. You can do videos. You can do education. You can do a lot of other things. So that uncommon or that common success. So I John Lee Dumas. So the it's the common path to uncommon success. This is this is phenomenal, brother. Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people is absolutely just. I think that should be taught in every elementary middle school and high school and college and everybody should read it every single year at least once. I really like Alex Hormozzi. Uh he's uh he, he's probably somebody a lot of the ag world doesn't know. He's a big buff bodybuilding dude, but he is sharp. He is his business sense is is top notch. So I would check out Alex Hormozzi too, but I think uh under understand that health. The the last thing that I want to say is every farmer is a business owner. Every farmer is an entrepreneur, and the most valuable asset that they have is themselves. So when we take care of ourselves, we can perform better. We can show up better for our family. We can show up better for the farm. We can show up better for every aspect of our lives. So understanding that how we take care of ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically matters a whole, whole lot. Great thoughts. Well, where can people find you, find more about you, reach out if they want to, uh, Go ahead and plug also your YouTube channel or whatever else you'd like to, to plug at the moment. The core of what we do is it's me and McGee Market. That's the physical location. But I do consulting and, and that kind of stuff. And that platform form is called Sewing Prosperity. That's the podcast. That's uh, books. Wrote a book, Father's Heart. It, it documents the journey with Lander, my, my son, and the cancer, what we did. And then I end that book. And this is what has thrown a lot of people off, but this audience probably understand it is this idea of regenerative capitalism, right? Like this, this prosperity world, this food system we're building, that's how, that's how we overcome cancer. So that's uh, sowing prosperity and that Logan Duval, uh, me and McGee market, all that, all that, uh, you know, in the Google searches pulls, pulls stuff up. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was, this was awesome. I really appreciate you sharing some time and, and your wisdom with us today. I appreciate you, Jerry. Man, keep those amazing podcasts coming. I'm telling you, the Alan Savory one, I bet I have shared it to a hundred different people. It is the greatest podcast I've ever listened to. Uh, I think that was phenomenal. So, like, I don't know, maybe you need to do a recap, brother, and just, like, go back through it because it is, it's that good. That's what's probably, you sharing it is probably what's jumped that up to, yep, the number one listened to uh, podcast of mine. And it's, you know, a relatively recent one, which is pretty impressive that it's moved up to the number one listen uh, one. And, and so it's so short a time. So I appreciate it. I'm glad you liked it. I ain't done, brother. It, it's that good. It's that good. <laughs> good. Good. Thank you. Well, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jared. Thank you for listening to the Sewing Prosperity Podcast. We hope that you have learned something new and that you are inspired to adopt regenerative practices in your community. Remember that by working together, we can create a sustainable and abundant future for ourselves and for future generations.